Hello everybody. So this is the lecture for ecological roles and I wanted to spend some time thinking about like different roles organisms play within the environment within a food web and I thought one of the best ways to do that was by looking at trophic structure. What that means is how different species like have different feeding relationships within a community. So basically who is eating whom in in a food chain. Now the uh, the simplest way to like define you know who is eating whom is with a food chain where we have this classic classic example of you know some sort of plant eaten by an insect eaten by a, a predator that the snake then eats the frog and then the owl eats the snake right um, so what I want to spend some time is thinking about you know these different steps within the food chain so um, the first step within pretty much any food chain is producers. It's the base of a food web. It's what uh, th this <laughs> this definition here is really really vague, kind of on purpose here. But what you know what a plant does is it produces energy from a different type of energy. So it takes solar energy and turns it into chemical energy. <laughs> energy specifically like sugars okay now whether we're talking about a tree a flower or algae in a lake that's pretty much all taking solar energy and putting it into chemical energy now but there's also bacteria that live in like hot springs that will take one form of chemical energy of uh, like chemicals way down deep under the under the earth that come up in this hot water and then it turns it into um, organic chemical energy basically. So all th those type of examples are producers. And then we have consumers. Now um, consumers are using energy from other organisms. So think about these bison, right? These bison are eating grass. They're taking energy from producers. This chipmunk is consuming corn so again from consumers but then you have like higher level consumers right so predators so this um, this wolf here is eating the, is going to eat this bison right and that wolf is again a consumer it's just a higher level consumer now same thing goes with those snakes you can think of you know just consumers well if we were to go back to this food chain this caterpillar would be what we call a primary consumer secondary tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer. It's just basically like first, second, third, and fourth consumer within the food chain. But then you get to a point where, you know, things die and you get these decomposers. Now really they're just a subset of consumers, but they're just consuming dead organic matter. And what, what decomposers will do will be um, they're not really like scavengers necessarily, but they're organisms that will eat dead stuff and then put those nutrients back into the soil that can basically be used by producers again. So if this, I don't know what this is, a dead deer maybe, um, you know, sure it looks gross around the deer right now, but you know, within a year or two, there'll be a nice, very verdant patch of, of plants that are growing here because all of those nutrients were released back into the soil here. So, but when we think about this food chain then, this is really um, kind of unrealistic, right? Well, first off, there's more than just one, th these, this line of species. And it's not, every caterpillar is not eaten by mouse and every mouse is not eaten by a snake. There's a lot of, you know, decomposers here represented by the mushrooms that the snake should go to the mushrooms, the, the, um, mouse here should be there should be an arrow to the mushrooms and that's all funneling nutrients back to these plants so what we actually see is trophic structure is really defined by a complicated interactions what we call a food web right because each species eats more than one thing or usually I should that's not always the thing but you know like this example here this seabird here is eating these mackerel fish and these you know, reef fish so you know they're eating a variety of different species um, 
And organisms change what they eat, you know, throughout their life. So tadpoles will generally eat algae as, as little tadpoles, but as they grow up and turn into frogs, they switch over to eating insects. So this food chain, you know, isn't necessarily always true. Um, then throughout the seasons, um, lots of things will change what they eat. Think about a white-tailed deer here in Wisconsin where you've got... Um, uh, you know, during the summer, they're eating plants that are sprouting up. In the fall, they're going to be eating corn from the fields. But, you know, through winter, although those food sources go away and they're eating barks on trees, bark off of trees. So a, you know, a single food, even a single food web, let alone a food chain, doesn't always work um, to explain uh, what's what's going on. And what we should say is, even individual species will change. So this is a group of tadpoles, and these are Mexican spadefoot tadpoles. They're these really cool tadpoles um, that these are actually all siblings, right? They're brothers and sisters and um, all born at the same time, but there's some genetic stuff that switches on and off that makes um, some of the tadpoles into these like really carnivorous um, things. They have different mouth morphology shape I was going to say morphology, but that just means basically shape uh, when we're talking about anatomy. Uh, and they're predatory, and they get really big, and they eat their brothers and sisters. And so um, there's not that many of them that will turn into that, but there's a variety of different factors that can do that. So even like within the same species at the same time, different individuals will be diff eating different things. So really, a food web should look more something like this, where we have, you know, all these really complicated interactions and really hard thing to tease apart. But, you know, that's the reality of the system. So what we can think about through these different roles of producer to consumer to secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and so forth, is how energy flows through a system. So what we see is a bunch of sunlight, solar energy is hitting the Earth. And about 1% of that light is actually converted to chemical energy. Um, there's so much energy that hits the earth that, of, uh, that doesn't get used and put directly into plants. But what, what we call that is primary production, the rate at which solar energy is converted to chemical energy. Now, if you look across the world, what we see is uh, most of the... Uh, the the primary production is really done in the ocean with li tiny little algae, single-celled, tiny little plants, basically. Um, the other 35% is basically plants doing photosynthesis, growing, doing primary production on land. The thing is, what we see is, so we start out with some amount of energy done by the primary producers, but each time it's eaten, that energy is lost. So every transfer of energy, we can think of this caterpillar eating this flower as a transfer of energy from the flower into the caterpillar. Okay. Now, a lot of that energy is lost. Now, this is just because of um, the way energy works. It's con when it gets converted, some of it gets lost. So in warm-blooded things, what we see is we lose a lot of energy heating up our bodies. But, well, first what I should say is where does that energy go? Well, a lot of that energy is just pooped out, right? So when we eat a piece of corn, right, you do not pr uh, process all of that corn. You poop some of that out, right? Then a, a decent amount of it is lost as metabolic heat. So the process of actually breaking down a piece of corn into its calories and its main energy, you lose some energy and about 35% of that. So of plants or food that you eat, you only put about 15% of it on average into the next level. So, um, and, and what we see is that it's like higher for cold blooded things and lower for warm blooded things because that metabolic heat is different for higher and lower things. So when we go from a plant to a, uh, a grasshopper here, we get a reduction of energy. So even if 
all of the plants were eaten by grasshoppers, you would only be able to support about one tenth of the am the amount. This is this, this is in joules. So if you have ten thousand joules, that's a unit of energy of primary producers here, you're only going to have about a thousand joules of primary consumers. So what we see is if you just go out and like take a walk outside through a forest, right? Um, and what are you going to see the most of? If you were to, you know, put uh, a, a cordon off like a square mile of forest and put all the producers in a pile and then all the primary consumers in a pile and basically let's just say producers versus consumers. You're going to have a big pile of plants and not that much consumers, right? And that's because you're losing energy each time. Um, so when we think about bringing this this I, law of basically energy loss to our personal choices, what we it, there's there's been a, a big movement lately to be um, be vegetarian, right? And it's becoming much more common that people are uh, turn, changing to a vegetarian lifestyle. If not, you know, completely just eating vegetarian a little bit more often. So, and why is this a good idea? Um, from this energetic perspective, let's, let's, let's go back to here and think about, let's say this is corn that we're feeding to cattle. So cattle then would be the primary consumers and then we would be the secondary consumers at, um, at, at, at this level. So, Think about the energy that is lost by t getting it to two steps, okay? If we need, you know, we ha only have a limited amount of land. So if we're taking that limited amount of land and growing food for cattle and then eating that cattle, we don't get as many humans, basically. We can't support as many humans. But if we were to just eat that corn in the first place, we would be able to have a whole lot more humans with the same amount of land being used. So um, what we see is across the world, about 40% of the grain that is produced is fed to livestock. Actually in the US it's somewhere around 60 to, 60 to 70%. <coughs> There's 7 billion livestock in the US, that's, you know, we're almost as many humans as we have on the planet. Um, so in some ways it's uh, really environmentally friendly to be vegetarian or eating at that, having humans be at that primary consumer level. And um, there's a lot of uh, ways you can think about this of think about what it takes to make a quarter pound of hamburger, right? So just one hamburger takes 6.7 pounds of grains and forage for it to create a quarter pound. So this is why we're saying, why don't we just eat this gra these grains and that'll have way more calories for us th and we could potentially need a lot less agriculture to grow the same number of humans. Takes a ton of water, a lot of land, and a lot of fossil fuel energy to bring us that quarter pound hamburger, to produce that quarter pound of hamburger. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's pretty clear that eating a lot of red meat, now red meat isn't bad, like eating beef isn't always bad, right? Some amount of it is great, and there's a lot of really good nutrients that you can get from meat. Uh, but people that, ha that eat more red meat have a higher risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. So one of the ways that we're, uh, a lot of recommendations are being made is to cut down on our uh, environmental input or our environmental footprint is to cut down on meat consumption, right? Or if you are going to eat meat, choose more ecologically efficient meats. So grass-fed cows, cows that are not fed um, corn in a in a feedlot but think about like the the cows that are maybe more ranched out west and free more free range um, chicken if you look at like if you were to build a um, you know one chicken breast or a quarter pound of chicken breast these numbers are all very very much lower 
Um, and a lot of people are saying, let's go for meat-free Mondays. And if everyone in the U.S. were to not eat meat on one day a week, it would be like taking 30 to 40 million cars off the road for one year. Now, that's not every money, every Monday, but that's if, um, you know, if the U.S. population were to eat for a year on Meat Free Mondays. And that is, you know, a huge, I think, potentially a really big impact. Um, I know a lot of people like their meat, but there's also a lot of vegetarian options. So it's something you can uh, consider. All right. That's it for this lecture. See you later.